Well, I discovered something interesting the other day. It's probably more interesting to me than it is to you. But I discovered that the drawer at the bottom of my oven actually has a purpose beyond just storing cookie trays. Here's a picture. I had no idea that that drawer, and I, we all know which drawer I'm talking about, had any purpose other than putting cookie sheets and muffin trays in. I, I thought my whole life that that's what that drawer was for. Turns out that that is a heating drawer in order to keep your food warm after you've cooked it. How useful, and I have not been using it. And so it got me thinking, what else in my house have I been misusing or misunderstanding? So I did some research. It was embarrassing. Spaghetti spoons. Did you know that the hole in the middle of spaghetti spoons is not for draining water, it is for measuring a serving size of pasta for spaghetti? That is what that is for right there. That one, once the hole is filled, that's one serving size. Can't believe it. <laughs> Tic Tacs. We all love Tic Tacs. They've been keeping America's breath fresh for years. But did you know that Tic Tacs have an inbuilt dispenser in the lid? The way that I've been shaking them like a maniac trying to get them out, but what you're supposed to do with a Tic Tac box is tip it upside down on its side, and then when you open the lid, voila, there's one Tic Tac sitting in the lid. Now, this admittedly is a little bit useless because no one eats just one Tic Tac. We all know it. The last one is pretty interesting. The little ketchup cups at restaurants that you fill with ketchup or barbecue sauce, did you know that they are meant to extend out, that you can actually pull them and they'll unfold to get bigger so that you can dip your burger or your sandwich? I always get nervous about saying burger in an English accent, by the way. Uh, but yeah, this is what it's actually for. Those folds are so that the cup will extend out. Who knew that all of these little things had uses, had something more to them than I realized? And today we're talking about prayer and we're talking about the Holy Spirit, and I think that most of us in our prayer life experience prayer as something a little bit like what we just saw, something that is often misunderstood, that sometimes is misused, and has so much more to it than we realize. And that is the beauty of what the Holy Spirit shows us in prayer. We are deep into this series now on the Holy Spirit, and we have been looking at and reminding ourselves of who our God is. Our God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's part of who he is. It is a core part of who he is. And so we have been trying to ask ourselves and remind ourselves of the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives as believers. Why did God give us his spirit? What does he do? And one of the things that he does most critically is he transforms our prayer life. He moves our prayer life from being something that can often be misused, misunderstood, or misdirected into something that can transform us. So we are going to look at one of the most beloved passages in the Bible today. We're going to look at Romans 8. And in Romans 8, the Apostle Paul is going to teach us about the Holy Spirit in prayer. He is going to teach us about the importance of the role of the Holy Spirit in our prayer lives. So if you would, go ahead and read God's word with me. We are in Romans 8, verses 22 through 27. It says this, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows that what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The first thing that we see in this passage is our weakness. Our weakness. I have a group of eighth grade leaders in middle school who are planning a fundraising event in a couple of weeks uh, over at our Kesslinger campus. It's going to be a family scavenger hunt to raise money for Buddy Break. And as part of that, they have been going out into the community to see if anybody would be willing to donate prizes for a raffle. 
Now, they have not enjoyed going and speaking to strangers. And probably you remember when you were in middle school, you don't like speaking to strangers. You probably don't like doing it now. But this middle school in particular that I'm going to talk about really didn't like it. Uh, and she was out on one such occasion trying to go and talk to people to try and get donations. Uh, and she just got herself so worked up, so anxious that she uh, got very emotional and couldn't go inside. And she was just thinking, oh my gosh, what if I say the wrong thing? I don't know what I'm supposed to ask. I don't know how I'm supposed to ask it. What if they get upset with me? What if they don't want to give me a donation? <clears throat> and she got herself thinking about all these different things. Now, to her credit, and I'm really proud of her, she went in and she did it. But what I was thinking this week as I was praying about what we're talking about is I thought, how often is our prayer life like that middle schooler? How often do we find ourselves getting so worked up, confused about what do we say, how do we say it, what if God doesn't give us what we ask him for? We get so worked up about our prayer life because we have a weakness. This is what Paul writes in chapter 8 of Romans. He says, starting in verse 22, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And then jumping ahead to verse 26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought. See, in this part of Romans, in this section of Paul's letter to the church in Rome, he is unpacking, he is describing the state of the world that we live in. And what he does is he talks about this world that groans, this world that is groaning, a broken place, a place that is in need of redemption, that is waiting for and groaning for redemption. And what he says is that we too groan, meaning believers, he says we too groan inwardly. And that's really important for us this morning. The reason it's important is because what Paul is doing there by saying that, by saying that the world groans and we groan, Paul is assuming that even Christians do not escape the difficulty of the world that we live in. Christianity as a religion, as a relationship with God, is not an escape from struggle. And that's one of the reasons that we need prayer. That's why this topic, this idea is so important. Because we live in a broken world that is groaning for redemption. And we're not apart from that if we trust in Jesus. We're in the thick of it. We're right in the middle of it. We're in a world that is groaning to be made new. And then when Paul gets down to verse 26, he says that prayer is difficult. He says that the Spirit has to help us in our weakness because we don't know what to pray as we ought. I think this is what Paul is saying. He's saying prayer is necessary, but prayer is hard. Prayer is necessary, but it is hard. We need the Holy Spirit to be a part of our prayer life because we have weakness, because prayer is difficult to do. Jesus' disciples, when they would walk with him, when they would be with him, they would look at lots of parts of his life and ask him why he did what he did, ask him to teach them the things that he knew, but there was one in particular that stands out on one such occasion. They are with Jesus, and the disciples come to Jesus, and they ask him, Lord, how do we pray? It's the passage in the Bible where Jesus teaches them the Lord's Prayer. But they come to Jesus, the disciples, these men who've been traveling with him, and they say, Jesus, tell us how we are supposed to pray. Show us how to do it. Because they didn't know. Because prayer was difficult. They were in the midst of a broken world and they so often needed to speak with God. They needed to reach out to God and ask him to help them, but they didn't know how to do it. The only context that the disciples had for prayer was most likely the priests at the temple and the Jewish rulers who would have to go through rituals, who would have to go through cleansing in order to pray. They probably asked this question to Jesus because Jesus was the only person they had ever met who prayed to God as Father. Jesus was the first person to talk to God like that, to say, our Father, my Father. Have you ever had a relationship with someone and you see them pray or you hear them pray 
and you see the incredible impact it has on their life, the way that it encourages them, and you feel a little bit envious, and you, you wonder deep inside, I, I wish I could pray like that. I want to know what it's like to pray like that when the, those prayers can encourage and strengthen me in the difficulty of my life. I've felt like that an awful lot. And I think that that's how the disciples felt. I think that they saw Jesus. They saw the relationship that he had with God. The way that he prayed, he would go off in many, many times in his journey and just pray to his father, and they saw the impact it had on him. Right before the cross, he goes to the garden, and he invites three of the disciples to come, Peter, James, and John, and they watch as he prays in agony to his father that he lets his heart out before his father. I think they saw that, and they wanted that. They wanted to know how to pray because they were weak and they didn't know how to. When I was a kid, I used to think that if I was praying to God, I had to do this. And if I didn't do this, I didn't have like cell service. I had no signal. God wasn't going to hear me unless my hands were just right in the right zone. And I laugh about that now. But the truth is, even now, my struggles are not all that different from that. There are times when I don't know what I'm supposed to pray. There are times when I have these burdens on my heart, these struggles, and I don't know how to talk to God about them. I worry, is he listening? Does he hear my prayer? Was it a good enough prayer? Did I say the right words? Am I asking in according with his will? Even those of us who have been Christians for a long time struggle with prayer because prayer is difficult and this world is broken. The word that Paul chooses to use in this passage more than once is groan. He says the world is groaning, we are groaning. He goes on to say that the spirit is groaning. And one commentator says that the word that Paul uses in this passage for groaning is like a baby's cry. When babies are first born into the world and they don't know how to speak, they cry for their needs. When they need to eat, when they need to sleep, when they need comfort, they cry. They don't know how to put words to it. Isn't that what a lot of our prayers are like as well? Isn't Paul capturing perfectly how we feel in the midst of this world? Sometimes we groan, we yearn for God to show up and make a difference, to change things, to meet us in our needs. Now, some of our weaknesses, I think, can be a little bit more sinister, a little bit more sinful. This is what James says in his letter. In James chapter 4, verse 3, he says, You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Now, unfortunately, I've always found this verse to be a little too good at describing my prayer life. I spend an awful lot of time in prayer asking God for things for me, for focusing on me, things that I can spend on my passions. See, prayer is not so that God will grant our wishes. Prayer is not about getting the things that we want the way that we want them so that we can be happy. Prayer is for us, but prayer is not about us. It's a gift from God for us, but he did not give us prayer so that we could use it to think more about ourselves again. So what's at the root of all this weakness? What is it that needs to change? What is it that we need the Holy Spirit for to transform our prayer life? I think at the bottom of all those weaknesses, not knowing how to pray, praying with bad motives, not knowing what to say, all comes from not knowing who God really is. I think it comes from a misunderstanding of who is on the other side of prayer. Because if we don't understand who is on the other side of our prayers, we won't know how to pray, we won't know what to pray, we won't know why to pray. So the Spirit helps us in our weakness. God sends us His Spirit. And this is the Spirit's work. That's the second thing that we see in this passage, the Spirit's work. Learning to communicate with your baby is a hard thing to do. Parents know that. Mothers especially this morning, you guys probably know that. And the first time Janae left me at home with both of our boys after we'd had Benjamin, I got a reminder of how difficult it is to communicate with babies. At the time, neither one of them could communicate really. Uh, ben was obviously just born, so he couldn't 
do anything but cry. And Jonathan was older, but he still hadn't fully learned how to talk. And so he, it was kind of broken English. It was probably a lot like you guys trying to understand my accent on any given Sunday morning. And I would rush around the kitchen. I'm playing with the boys, constantly trying to work out, you know, this, eh, eh, no, and I'm, I'm dashing, trying to find things. Is it milk? Is it food? Is it toys? And then Janae comes home. And in comes mother, and it's like there's some secret code language between mother and children. And I, I do not understand how she does it to this day, that when that child makes a certain noise in a certain way, Janine knows immediately this is what they want. This is what they need. You see, this is what Paul writes in Romans 8. He says in verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. See, the Spirit of God understands our needs, just like Janae understood our children's groanings, or understood our groanings. The Spirit knows our groanings. He understands our cries, our deepest yearnings and longings. God's Spirit works against our weakness by perfecting our line of communication with God. That's what the Spirit does. And he does this in three ways. The first way is he works in us. And he works in us by assuring us of our adoption as children so that when we pray, we pray to a father. We pray to our father. In verse 15 of this same chapter, this is what Paul says. He says, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. See, in verse 15, in that little statement, what Paul is saying is that the spirit reminds us that because of the work of God, we are the children of God. Because of what God did through Jesus on the cross, we have been adopted into his family. If we trust Jesus, then we are his children. And the Spirit continually reminds us of that fact. He brings that to mind. He helps us understand that we are not just praying to God, we are praying to our Father in heaven. We can come to him like a young child. When Paul says that we cry, Abba, Father, Abba is an Aramaic word. And the closest translation that we could give this morning is dada. Abba is a, probably a very embarrassing phrase for a first century Jewish or Palestinian to say. Because it's what is baby talk, dada. What Paul is doing by using that word is he's saying you can come to God just like an innocent child comes to their parents. With no inhibitions, with no fear, with only the knowledge that their parent is there for their good that they love them. Wouldn't that make a difference in our prayer life? If we remembered every time that we spoke to God, we are not just praying to God, we are praying to our Father. If you're in Christ, you approach God every single time as a dearly beloved child, not just as a servant, not just as a subject of a king, but as a child. When my son comes to me, when Jonathan runs to me, and needs something from me, it doesn't matter how he does it, it doesn't matter whether he has all the right words together, I wanna listen to him. I wanna know everything that he needs me for. I enjoy doing that. And friends, if a sinner like me can do that for my son, what do you think God does? Because God is far better than any earthly father. He welcomes us every time. The Spirit of God doesn't just work in us, though. He works for us. He helps us know what to pray. That's what Paul says in verse 26. He says, The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. In that sentence, the word for for is a Greek word, huper. And huper essentially is where we get our English word hyper. What Paul is saying there is he's saying that the Spirit himself intercedes more than us on our behalf, more than us. He makes our prayers hyper prayers. 
The Spirit of God, what He does when He dwells in our lives, in our hearts, is that He perfects our broken prayers. When we don't know what to say, when we don't know how to say it, the Spirit of God is at work in our hearts, interceding for us with groanings too deep for words. How loving is that? Who else could do that for us? Understand the depths of our needs and our yearnings so intimately that they can perfect our broken prayers, that they can put words to our pain, that they can comfort us even when we don't know what to say. Now, this doesn't mean that all of our prayers as Christians are going to be incredibly eloquent and wonderful and have all of the right words, but what it does mean is that the power of our prayers are not in the words that we say. It's in the Spirit of God. That's who makes our prayers perfect. That's who makes our prayers effective is the Spirit of God. God hears our prayers as perfect because the Holy Spirit is interceding for us with groanings too deep for words. Now the third way that the Spirit works on us is through us. He works in us, he works for us, and he also works through us. I want you to notice that whenever God speaks to his people in the Bible, most often he's speaking in the plural. For example, in verse 15 he says that we have the spirit of adoptions as sons by whom we cry. And then later in verse 26 he says that the spirit intercedes for us. Even in the Bible when you read the word you, most often it is really y'all, a plural version of you. Because God relates to his pe- pe- people communally. Prayer is a communal thing. Christianity is a communal thing. If we remember back to the spring, we talked an awful lot in Ephesians about how the Spirit wants us to be unified, that he has broken down the walls of hostility, that he wants us to be one body. The same is true in prayer. The Spirit wants us to be knit together in prayer. The Spirit of God works to give us new desires to change our hearts so that we will pray for one another and with one another. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a private prayer life, but what I am saying is that it shouldn't stay there. Praying in the Spirit is not something that you always do by yourself. Sometimes the Spirit wants to use you to pray for people, with people. Where our heart is inclined to be inward and self-centered, the Spirit of God tends it outward to love God and to love our neighbor. That's one thing that we've already talked about in this series, that the Holy Spirit changes our heart. Some of the sweetest times and most powerful times of prayer in my life have actually been not when I was been by myself, but when I have been with others in the family of God. When I have been with them as they pray for me. And when I have been with them as I pray for them. Prayer is something that is meant to be done in community because God sends his spirit to work in his people together. There's joy in sharing one another's burdens with one another. There's joy in crying out to God with one another. You have no idea what the Spirit might pray through you for someone else and what those prayers might mean for the person that hears them. The Spirit loves to use our prayers to love others and care for others. So the Spirit works in us to remind us that we are children of God. He works for us to put words to our groanings. And he works through us to direct us outward, to pray for others with others. But he does all this for a purpose. He does all this for a very clear purpose. He does it for the will of God. And that's the third thing that we see in this passage is we see the will of God in prayer. Paul goes to say in verse 27, he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See, Paul tells us that the Spirit prays according to the will of God. That's how the Spirit prays. And the Bible says again and again that the will of God is that he would be known in all the earth. 
And so the goal of our prayer should be the same as the goal of the Spirit's prayer, that God would be known. See, if our greatest weakness in prayer that we began with is that we don't understand the God that we pray to, we don't know who is on the other side of prayer, we don't understand him, then the greatest thing that God can do for us is through prayer make himself known. Teach us who he is. Make himself known. See, our weakness really is that we pray to God like he's a plumber. We talk to God like he is the guy that we call up to fix something when it goes wrong. And that's usually the only time that we speak to him. And so we don't really know who he is. Because usually when we're speaking with him, we're thinking about what we need, what he needs to give us, what he needs to fix. We're not thinking about him. But God's not a plumber. He's not Mr. Fix-It. He's our father. If you are a Christian, then God is your father. And he should be the one that we speak to. He should be the one that we love to pray to because to speak with him is in itself a comfort. To get him, to know him, Regardless of whether we all get all of our prayers answered the way that we want them, regardless whether things turn out the way that we want them to, to get God in the middle of this groaning, yearning world is the most loving thing that God can do for us. It's to give him himself. Let me tell you the truth this morning. And it's, it's, I think it's a hard truth, especially if you are very aware in this season of the pain of this broken world. The most loving and the most wonderful thing that God can do for you, the best thing that he can do for your soul is not necessarily give you what you've asked him for. It's to give you himself. Because I think what we really need in this broken world, sometimes more than getting what we want when we want it, is to get God. Is to have God grieve with us, weep with us, struggle with us, to have God rejoice with us, celebrate with us, laugh with us, to have God guide us and lead us and teach us. All that yearning, all that groaning that this world has is to get God, is to know God. We don't always call it that. We don't always realize that that's what it is, but that is what it is. The brokenness in this world is because we need God. That's why the Bible says pray unceasingly, labor in prayer, pray with steadfastness because the Bible is telling us you need God. You don't need what he can give you, you need him. I knew uh, a boy who was adopted by a family and he had been in the foster care system for a long time. He'd been through some pretty difficult and painful things. But a wonderful family came along, a loving family, a family that loved Jesus, came along and adopted him, wanted him to be their son. So they brought him home, but he struggled with how to communicate with them. He didn't know how to talk to his new mom and dad, his new siblings. And one night, the, the father came downstairs and found his newly adopted son stealing Coke cans from the family pantry and hiding them, stockpiling them, in his room, kind of an odd thing to do. And so the father asked, why are you doing this? And he said, well, I thought if I asked you, you would be angry with me. I didn't, I didn't know if you would let me have what is yours. That father was heartbroken to hear the pain and the weakness in that adopted son that he didn't understand who his father was that he didn't understand the new relationship that he had now that he was adopted. He could ask his father for anything. He didn't need to, to worry, to try and fend for himself, to struggle for himself. He had a father now, and he could ask him anything. The father said, I'm, I'm your father. You can ask me for anything in this house. There is nothing in this house that is off limits to you because you are my son. You can ask me for anything. That child struggled with knowing how to communicate with his family because he didn't know who they were in relation to him. He didn't know what had happened for him. 
The aim of all of our prayer is to know God, to know who our Father is. One of Jesus' final prayers before he went to the cross, he was praying with his disciples, and he said, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's what he prayed for his disciples, that they would know you, the only true God, and they would know me whom you sent to save them. The Spirit of God wants us, more than anything else in our prayers, to know our Father. Because one day there will be no groaning anymore. This world will be made right. It will be restored. It will be redeemed. Everything that causes us pain will be washed away. Jesus Christ is going to make sure that that happens. But on that day, we will still pray. We will still pray because we do not pray so that we can get what is wrong set right. So that bad things will stop. We pray so that we can know the one who sets them right. As we close this morning, uh, our friend Laura Taro is going to come up. She's the leader of our Chapel Street groups and she is going to read a prayer for us this morning for Mother's Day. As we've been talking about prayer and we've been thinking about who God is, then I think this is the best way that we can end this morning. So, Laura, if you'd like to come up, and we're going to pray and we're going to rejoice in this God who sets things right. This is a prayer for Mother's Day, and before I start, I just want to let you know that there are copies of this at the welcome desk, so if you want to grab one on your way out, you're welcome to. Let's pray. Today we thank you, God, for the gift of mothers. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. Gentle, patient God, thank you for your tender care. Isaiah wrote that God will never forget us and that he knows each one of us just as a mother knows her own children. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. Gentle, patient God, thank you for your tender care. Jesus said that he longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Gentle, patient God, thank you for your tender care. Lord God, we pray for mothers everywhere. Like Sarah, may those who long for children be comforted in their pain. Like Hannah, may those who are given children after a long wait be willing to offer their children back into your care and into your service. Like Rachel, may those who grieve over the loss of their children who are missing in death or in other ways, trust your faithful goodness. Like Naomi and Ruth, may those who face great trials and difficulty trust that you can redeem their grief with new life. Like Mary, may we welcome the gift of your son into our lives. Like Lois and Eunice, may we be ready to share the love of Jesus with our children. Loving Father, we pray for those for whom this day is a time of heartache rather than celebration. We pray for those who have lost their mother. Heavenly Father, bless them with your love. We pray for those who long to be mothers. Heavenly Father, bless them with your love. We pray for those who struggle with the choices their children are making. Heavenly Father, bless them with your love. We pray for those who have a difficult relationship with their mother. Heavenly Father, bless them with your love. May we have the comfort of knowing that your love for us is constant, your understanding is perfect, and your compassion is never ending. Loving God, we give you thanks for all who care for us, who have encouraged us and helped us to grow, who have forgiven us, and cared for us when we were unwell, who have supported us when times were hard, who have challenged us, who have told us about you. Thank you, loving Father. Amen. Thank you for those words, Laura. And it's so true. It's so good to reflect on that. So as we close this morning, let me offer a benediction. Would you guys stand with me as we speak this? May we all of us this morning go under the guidance and the power of the Holy Spirit, may he pray and intercede for us with groanings too deep for words that we may know our Father. 
It's in the name of Jesus we go. Amen.